السلام عليكم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا رحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أرنا الطلعة الرشيدة والغرة الحميدة وكحل ناظرنا بنظرة منا إليه وعجل اللهم فرجاه وسهل اللهم مخرجه برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين So when you're gathering with the remembrance of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad As a gift to the soul of Sayyidina wa Azimina wa Nabiyina wa Habibi Qulubina wa Shafi'i Dhunubina Rasulullah and his honorable progeny recite the second salawat. For Allah to shower onto this gathering with his infinite mercy and compassion and to hasten the reappearance of Sayyidina wa Mawlana Sahib al-Asri wa zaman recite the third salawat with the loudest of your voices. One of the most fundamental questions that we're ought to ask as the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, as those who adhere to Kitab Allah, the Qur'an, wa sunnati Rasulullah and the sunnah of Rasulullah, and the traditions of the Ahl al-Bayt, wa siratul Ahl al-Bayt, one fundamental question that we ought to ask ourselves is that how is it that we survived? How is it that me and you are able to sit and congregate today and be able to propagate the teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt despite all the difficulties despite the genocides, despite the years of terror, 
murder and bloodshed. Despite the fact that for 70 years, 70 consecutive years, the name of Amir al Mu'mineen was taken in every Friday sermon around the Muslim empire in vain. The Khatib and the era of Bani Umayyah would not descend the member of Friday before he sent his la'na on Ali. And sometimes you would add Al Hassan and Al Hussein. And sometimes you would add Lady Fatima as well. People who carried the name of Ali, people who carried the name of Hassan, people who carried the name of Hussein were subject to prosecution and murder. Not long ago, in Iraq, Caravans would be stopped, cars would be stopped, individuals would be stopped, and their IDs would be checked. If they carried a name that indicated they are amongst the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, they would behead them and put their head in their laps. Sometimes an entire vehicle, an entire caravan. In the time of one of the Khulafa of Bani al-Abbas, he had a minister, a wazir, by the name of Ibn Qahtaba. Go read the biography of an Ibn Qahtaba. One day, the Khalifa, the so-called Khalifa al-Abbas, he called Ibn Qahtaba his wazir. He called him. In the middle of the night, they came knocking at his door. He was sleeping. He said, Ajib al-Amir. So he came. In the middle of the night, he's dizzy. Woke up from his sleep. And he says to him, the Khalifa says to him, Ibn Qahtaba, you are our wazir. What is it that you can offer to us? He says, I offer my wealth. Everything that I have. I offer my time. My dedication. He says, you're offering wealth to one who is wealthier than you. I don't need your wealth. You're offering your time. Everybody would offer me their time. What do you have to offer? Go home. As soon as he gets home, he's about to sleep again. Ajib al-Amir, he comes back. What do you have to offer to us? So he says, since what I offered earlier is not enough, I offer you my family, my children. May they be a sacrifice to you. He says, there are so many people who are willing to sacrifice themselves. Go home. As soon as he goes home, he calls him again, come back. What do you have to offer to us? Na'udhu Billah, He says, I offer you the woman of my family. He says, there are so many concubines and women here. I don't need the woman of your family. He sends him back. Then this guy doesn't go to sleep. He's sitting. He says, now I think I know what he wants. Because everything that I offered is no good for him. He comes back. He says to him, I have figured it out. I am your wazir. I am your right man, right hand man. What do you have to offer to us? He says, I offer you my akhirah. I offer you my deen. He says, you have a deal. He's about to go home. He says, but you just made a transaction. Where are you going? Since now you have given your akhirah, take the sword. 
Somebody will take you somewhere, execute what you need to do. So he goes to a home. They open a door and he sees a hundred elderly, frail men. And he says, I looked at them and they all looked so holy and so noble and so pious. And there the Jalat pushed me and he said, Ajib al Amir, do what you need to do. Behead them. Why? He says, what do you mean why? You already sold your Akhara. What difference does it make for you? So he said, I took the sword and I beheaded all of them. I was exhausted. I was tired. I was hateful of myself. I wanted to go. He says, where do you think you're going? Open another door. There's another hundred mid-aged men, noble men. You can tell that those people are holy, noble people. He said, but I can't. Enough of today. Please, excuse me from doing this. He says, what, what is the problem? What's stopping you? You've already given your akhirah. He said, I slaughtered them. He says the story. Ibn Qahtaba himself says the story. He says, I was about to leave. There was another room. I saw teenagers, boys. They don't even grow a mustache and a beard. Long story short, he says, I began to just take them one by one. The last one said, hold on. I know my neck is going to go, but do you know what you're doing? Do you know who we are? Do you know why we're here? He says, no, I don't. And I don't want to know. He says, well, I'm going to tell you why we're here. We are the Sadat. Our only crime is that we are the children of Ali ibn Abi Talib. We're innocent people. We haven't done anything. He says, when I heard that, I was shaken to the core. And he went through major depression. And he died in his depression. We go back to the main question, how is it possible for us to survive today, for us to sit here today? Number one, brothers and sisters, I am here to tell you that the number one cause is the divine intervention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yadullahi فوق أيديهم يمكرون ويمكر الله والله خير الماكرين الله سبحانه وتعالى's plan and today when you visit the shrine of Imam Abu Abdullah Al Hussein سيد الشهداء and you enter in his mausoleum in باب القبلة there is a massive hadith that is written there, a long hadith. What does this hadith narrate? Listen to me, pay attention to me. This hadith speaks of the 10th of Muharram. Imam Zain al Abidin is driven out of his tent. And he's been carried, he's being carried to go and leave Karbala with the captives. So he stops and he looks at the plains of Karbala. And he sees that those bodies, who are those bodies? Who do they belong to even? Because they have no heads. And then he notices a body that is demolished, cut into pieces, nothing left of it. With broken bones and a thousand wounds, he goes closer and he realizes that this is the body of his father Hussein. Why? Because Umar ibn Sa'd in the last moment said what? Ya khayl Allah wa sadr al-Husayni dusi. 
Or the horseman of God rides the back of your horses and tremble the body of Hussein. There was nothing left of the body of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Even he was wearing a ring. They could not take the ring out of his finger, so they amputated his finger. So he sees this. And the tradition says that Imam Zain al Abidin's life was exiting. He was about to die. Zainab. Zainab al Kubra was there, and her task given to her by the Imam of her time was to protect Zain al Abidin and protect the legacy of Imam al Hussein. So she comes to him and she says to him, Mali Araka Tajudu bi Nafsika Yabna Hakhi. Wawaritha. Sulalati, you are the inheritor. You are Zainul Abideen. Why do I see you? You're about to die. He says, Wa kayfala? Amma Zainab, how am I not supposed to die when I see this? Wa ara abi, wa umumati, wa abna umumati. They're in their blood and the worst part is that my aunt, there is no one to come and bury them. We are leaving them, there is no burial for them. What's going to happen to them? There is no moment of defeat greater than this one in the history of humanity. Where you look and there's absolutely no doubt that there was a defeat. A complete annihilation of Hussein and the family of Hussein and the name of Hussein and the body of Hussein. And if you spoke of, oh, Hussein is somehow going to be saved by God and his name is going to survive. People will laugh at you and say, you are a lunatic. There is no one here. There is nobody recording and there is no cameras and there is nothing. Nobody's even going to know what has happened. So Sayyidah Zainab says, Zain al-Abideen, إِنَّهُ لَعَهْدٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ إِلَىٰ رَسُولِهِ إِلَىٰ عَلِيٍّ أَمِيرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِلَىٰ أَبِيكَ الْحُسَيْنِ It is a pledge and an oath from Allah to Rasulullah to Amir al muminin to your father Hussein, that as soon as the battle here is done, then Allah will send people to gather onto these graves. They will bury them. And then they will create a mausoleum for your father Hussein. And this mausoleum will become a alam, a distinguished, honorable, sacred, Sanctuary on the face of the earth. And then all the leaders of hypocrisy and kufr, every man with evil intentions will do whatever they possibly can. And they will spend money. And they will go out of way and they will send troops to demolish it. And for the name of your father Hussein to be forgotten. But every single day Allah will give rise to the name of Hussein. This is Sayyidah Zainab on the 10th of Muharram during that defeat. But every day the name of your Hussein will rise. And to a point where the entire earth will know and appreciate your father and what he has done. And Allah will send people that will mourn and will cry. Today, there isn't a single village on the face of the earth. A single village. Every religion, every nationality, every language 
commemorate Hussein. It's God's divine plan. You cannot go against God's divine plan. Whatever you do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, وَيَأْبَ اللَّهِ لِيُتِمَّ نُورَهُ وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْكَافِرُونَ وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْمُشْرِكُونَ What is karah? Hate. They hate for this to happen. But Allah says, وَيَأْبَ اللَّهِ لِيُتِمَّ نُورَهُ It will happen. The promise from Allah. And Allah's promises are real. In fact, the Hadith Al-Qudsi says that the angels, they start laughing. They have no emotions. They smile at two occasions. They're working, they're doing their thing, then they stop and they smile. When? One time when Allah is trying to raise someone and the people are trying to bring him down. They smile, they say, look at those guys, they're wasting their time. Allah has decided to rise this man, rise this woman, elevate them. and They're trying to bring him down, impossible. And when the opposite happens, Allah wants to bring someone down and people are trying to take him up. Again, the angels are saying, look at those fools. They think that this is a possible task for them. So number one is the divine intervention, brothers and sisters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is so much to be said. There is so much to be talked about. So many verses to be recited and so many hadiths to be shared with you, my beloveds. And inshallah, I promise you that we will in the next upcoming series, inshallah. But second, is the resilience, the wisdom, the generosity, the steadfastness, the patience, the dedication of the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. The followers of Ahl al-Bayt are the most dedicated, most resilient, bravest, most generous, most giving, most dedicated people that history has ever witnessed. And all you need to do is just go to Arba'in. And there you find people, honorable people, begging you so they can massage your feet because you are a Za'ar of Hussein. Begging you to f eat food and drink and rest because you are a Za'ar of Imam al Hussein. People from China and Japan and Africa and America and all over the world with different nationalities. Millions upon millions of people, yet you do not see a single fight that breaks out. You see everyone in harmony. Why? Because the love of Ahl al-Bayt is part of our DNA. Because for their love, we're willing to do anything. In fact, I read an article in the peak of ISIS. Peak of ISIS. When ISIS had taken over, and it was such a dangerous time, and the lovers of Imam al Hussein were making the walk of Arba'in. They interviewed an old lady, frail, tired, she could not walk, and she's holding on to her grandkid, and they're walking from Basra, 2,000 kilometers to Karbala. So the interviewer asked her, he says, lady, take a cab, take a car. Why are you walking? You cannot walk. To his surprise, you know what she said. She said, this kid, his mom and dad had left last week. They were doing the walk. And I got a call that they have been killed in a car bomb. I hung up the phone and I told my grandson, let's go. We have to walk to Hussein. He says, but your son died. Your daughter-in-law died. Now you're coming and you're bringing this shit. She says, because two of the Za'ars of Hussein decreased. And I cannot let that happen.
I have seen with my two eyes a woman who says, I only had one cow that belonged to me. And I would milk this cow and I would make milk and cheese and I would sustain myself all year. In the 10th of Safar, I slaughtered the cow. I made food for five days. When it's finished, now I am walking to Hussein. I have nothing. And this is what this world cannot fathom. This world is not ready. When they see the love and the dedication that we have for Amir al Mu'mineen and the cause of Amir al Mu'mineen. Maytham al Tamar, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib says to him, Ya Maytham, would you like me to tell you how your ending will be? He says, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, I would love to. If you are sharing it with me, I would love to. He says, Ya Maytham, you will be in a time where it will be forbidden to speak of my fada'il, and you will do so. So they will take you. And they take you to a palm tree, and they will crucify you on the palm tree, and they will amputate your tongue. So Maytham, he was sitting, and you would think, you would tell Imam Ali that, will this hurt? How long will it take? Will I break? Well, what will happen? He says to him, Oh my Mawla, O oh Amir al Mu'mineen, I just want to know if my love and dedication to you will decrease from what it is today in any moment of my life until they bury me. That's all I want to know. He says, No, yeah, Maytham, you will be fine. Then Amir al Mu'mineen showed him the palm tree. So every day he would go and water the palm tree and he would pray to Raka'a of Namaz in that palm tree. And he would say, You are my best friend. So when they seized him and they took him, he says, I'll tell you what you will do with me. You will do this and this and this and this. He said, No, no, we're going to change the plan. He says, Wallahi, my master never lies. You cannot change the plan. And the same dedication of Maytham runs in the veins of all those that attribute themselves to Amir al Mu'mineen. And we are blessed to have them as our role models, have Amir al Mu'mineen as our role models. And that's what allowed the Madhab of Ahl al Bayt to survive and become a global international phenomenon around the world. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. The survival kit, the survival plan. Because divine intervention, Allah says, I will not give you mu'jiza left, right, and center. That's not possible. Rasulullah also had to face enemies. Rasulullah also had to plan. Rasulullah also had advisors. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam had difficult days. And so did the ma'sumin. Also our dedication and love and unlimited generosity is also not enough. We have to have wisdom, we have to have a plan. And I want to give you a glimpse of a country that was established in the name of Fatima to Zahra. In the year 300 after Hijrah, third century Islam, the establishment of the Fatimi dynasty. <clears throat> and it is 256 years from the Islamic history that many of us are not aware of. We're clueless. Some people don't even know they existed. And it's a government established in the name of Fatima, honoring the name of Fatima. The most distinguished personality 
that outlived Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam from his, from his progeny. But before I speak of the Fatimi dynasty, I need you to know a little bit of history of what had happened. The Muslim historians today divide the Islamic eras into the following manner. Number one, the Khilaf al Rashida, which starts with Abu Bakr and ends with some Imam Ali. Say, so well, after Imam Ali, there is no Khilaf al Rashida. Some people will tell you no. After Imam Ali, Imam Hassan. They bring in Imam Hassan. And some people tell you Imam Hassan and Muawiyah. Regardless, this is the time frame. With a few years here and there, this is the... The second is Bani Umayyah that began with Muawiyah. And it continued until the beginning of Bani Al-Abbas. Now why did Bani Umayyah collapse? For many reasons, but the main reason is because Islam expanded to so many areas around the world. Excursion after excursion and territory after territory. So there was a lot of people... A lot of land that had entered the realm of Islam. Now whether that is acceptable, whether that is not acceptable, that's a different story. It was a lot of land, a lot of countries that came into the dominance of Islam, or the Muslims I shall say. And there was a distinction between the Mamalik, the Arabs, the non-Arabs, Quraysh, not Quraysh, there were seven classes created by the Muslim government for people. The elite of the elites were the Arabs of Quraysh. They were paid and treated differently than all the others, right? Then came the Arabs. But specifically the Arabs of Mecca and Medina and Hijaz. Also there were classes in there. Then the third were those who were half Arab, half something else. Then there were the non-Arabs. Then they were the converts into Islam who were Arab. Then, then the converts of Islam who were not Arab. Then the converts who were ex-slaves. So you can tell, you know, and everybody got their own share from Bayt al-Mal according to not their Iman, not their merits, not their Jihad, but according to their last name, according to their tribe, according to their asa association. And there was a lot of injustice that people saw, a lot of inequality. And you hear Islam speaking of equality, equality of humanity, justice, liberty, freedom. That was non-existent. So what happened? There was a rise by Bani al-Abbas, starting from Khurasan, by Abu Muslim al-Khurasani. Go look up Abu Muslim al Khurasani, this young warrior who raised an army and he took many territories, began to fall from the Umawi into the Abbasi realm. I'm just telling you history, by the way, huh? That's history. Now, which side do we take? Well, we don't take no sides. Here we don't take. Because. As soon as Bani Abbas was established, it was established on this slogan, this theme, Ar-Ridha min Ahli Muhammad, that we must bring in the Ahl al-Bayt, Ahl al-Bayt. And they named their government after Abbas. Who was Abbas? The uncle of Rasulullah. The youngest uncle of Rasulullah, Abbas, they named their government after him. And they said that we're going to bring Ahl al-Bayt and you know, Ahl al-Bayt have seen so much injustice and there has been so much corruption. So we will give them the leadership because they deserve to lead. But when they got into power, the first people they went against were the Ahl al-Bayt. 
In fact, Bani Abbas killed more of the Ahl al-Bayt than Bani Umayyah. And that's a discussion of its own. And people realized, even Abu Muslim al-Khurasani, he was killed. After he established the, the reign for them, he was assassinated. Because Abu Muslim al-Khurasani was what? Khurasani. He was Persian. And he asked for the Khalifa's sister's hand in marriage. So they told him, how dare you? You Persian asking for this woman from Quraysh. And that was the end of him. So people were upset. And that is why they established this movement in the northern African continent. The northern African continent established a movement by the name of the Fatimi dynasty who were the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. By the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. And they established a city by the name of Mahdiya near Cairo. And they had their chief in command after the Khalifa al-Mahdi Al-Fatimi, his name was Jawhar al-Siqilli. He was given the task to establish the city of Al-Qahira, Cairo. So he built Cairo. And he built there by the demand and the command of the Khalifa, Al-Azhar University. Al-Azhar in Cairo was established by the Fatimi dynasty. And after they established the Qahira, they moved from Al Mahdiya and they made their capital city Al Qahira, Cairo, in Egypt. And the most important thing about Egypt then was Al Azhar University and Al Azhar Mosque. So now that the followers of Ahl al Bayt are in charge, what did they do? What did they do? This is why we have. Like I said, this is part of our survival kit. Within there, there is something called wisdom. Within there, there is an ayah from the Holy Quran that says, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal maw'idatil hasana wa jadilhum billati hiya ahsan. That if you want to work in propagating the cause, the case, and the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to have hikmah, wisdom. And you have to speak with kindness and mercy and compassion. And you have to have reason in debate. You cannot say, you know, I will not use reason, I will not use aql. So when they established Cairo, they invited the imams of every madhab on their expense. Imagine that the followers of Ahl al-Bayt were killed and massacred in genocides. Now that they are in power, they say to the Imams of all the Madahib, we have established harmony here, we have established Cairo, we have established Al-Azhar University, come, we will give each of you a chair. The Hanafis, the Shafi'is, the Malikis, other schools at that time existed, other madhahib existed. You each have a chair. Teach. Teach your madhahib freely. Teach your ideas freely. Nobody's going to stop you. You know, a person comes to Imam al Sadiq, one of his companions, one of his great companions. Thank you. He says to Imam al-Sadiq, Ya ibn Rasulullah, 
I go to Hajj and people know me as a faqih, people know me as a scholar. And I am a devout student to you. But some of them, they come to me. I know they are amongst the followers of Ahlul Bayt. I know they are amongst your followers. So when they ask me, I give them their, I give them your opinion. And I know some of them, when they come to me, they do not follow your madhab. So I give them the opinion of their own madhab. And some of them, they come, I don't know them, which madhab they follow. So I give them both opinions. Is what I am doing okay or is it not okay? Imam al-Sadiq says, Barakallahu feek. May Allah bless this effort. This is what I want you to do. Why? Because you will never appreciate the opinion of Ahl al-Bayt unless you place them next to others. Believe me. You will never appreciate a beautiful diamond unless you place it next to something else. And also because Imam al-Sadiq believes in pluralism, freedom of speech, freedom of opinion, freedom of practice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Holy Quran says to Rasulullah, you are just their teacher, but you cannot control them. You cannot force them. In fact, you cannot exercise methods of force upon them. So they establish Cairo and they put chairs for every madhab. Not only that, if you look at the body structure of their government, they had Christian ministers. The minister of their finance was a Jewish man for many years until he died. Jewish man. Today, why is the Muslim world suffering? Why do we have so much corruption? Because when I get into power, I have to bring my family and my cousins and my nephews and my clan and my tribe. I don't bring people based on merits. When you want to lead a sector in the government, a person's religion is secondary. First and foremost, does he know what he's doing? Is he capable to do this? Is he fit for this task? Is he not corrupt? That is it. Let him do that. Besides, the land belongs to everyone. If a country is mostly populated by Muslims, but it also has non-Muslims, they are citizens, lawful citizens of that country. It belongs to them as it belongs to others. So there when there was, the Ky when Cairo was established and there were non-Muslims and minorities, they must enjoy that country just as others as well. And in their 256 years, this is very, very, very important. Of rain, they did not prohibit and stop people from praying taraweeh. As you all know, we don't believe in taraweeh. It's not a secret. But they did not exercise their authority above others. You want to pray taraweeh? Go pray taraweeh. The masjid is open for you, and we will even protect you. If we're not joining you, it doesn't mean that we will stop you. And through freedom of thought, through the kindness of the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt, through the manners of the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt, it was the golden era for all people that lived there, whether they were Muslim or non-Muslim, whether they were Shia or they were Sunni. They lived in the golden era. And Cairo was thriving. And business was growing. And people lived in harmony. And there was a church and a Shia masjid and a Sunni masjid and a synagogue. And people lived freely. And they practiced freely. Today, brothers and sisters, and with this I want to conclude today. We, the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, must take the same plan and make sure that we showcase 
to the outside world and not just to us in our own bubble. So we must demonstrate this to the world. That's what do the Ahl al-Bayt stand for? You don't necessarily have to adhere to the madhab of Ahl al-Bayt. If you like certain things about what they have done and what they have said, and you find them to be a solution for your life, or within your problems, then let us offer them that solution. Let us make the Ahl al-Bayt available to them. Let's get out of our bubbles. Let's not do things that dishearten people and drive them away from the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt for selfish reasons. Sometimes we are so selfish with the Ahl al-Bayt. We do things and we say, why do you do this? Don't you know that this will drive away people if they see this from the madhab of Ahl al-Bayt? It doesn't matter. I care about myself. Why? If you have a treasure, and you have a gift, and you have a way of salvation and a way of life, share that with others. Should not be selfish, we should not be selfish with it. And that is why I believe one of the greatest gifts that we can offer humanity at this time today, and it does not matter who they are and what their background is and what language they speak and what nationality they have, as the legacy of the du'as of Ahl al-Bayt. Offer this du'a to anyone. And it does not matter what religion and what madhab they follow. Offer them this du'a and see what it does to their soul. But if we're only sitting in our own homes and our own masajid and reciting du'a kumail, what good would that do? Only when we open our doors to others and allow them to enjoy the legacy of the communication of the Ahl al-Bayt with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when they truly will understand that they are the gateway to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I know that there is a dua. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with this dua. Love this dua, but I want to re-emphasize this dua. I only have tomorrow with you all. Once again, I thank you for your punctuality. I think the mu'jizah is almost there. Inshallah, tomorrow it will take full effect. As tomorrow will be my last night, inshallah. So we will have a lecture and finish off with Q&A. So you can come with your questions. And tonight I want to go to a portion of a dua that we ought to recite every morning. And I guarantee you, you'd read this dua every morning. It doesn't matter when you wake up. Whenever you wake up, however you wake up, read this dua. And you don't have to do it right away. Don't make things difficult for you. When you have time, in the morning, start your day with this dua. Dua sabah by Amir al-Mu'mineen wa Mawla al-Muhadeen Ali ibn Abi Talib start it start your day with this dua and towards the end of the dua you do sujood huh? to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Islam we don't do sujood to anyone but Allah بَأَنَّ السُّجُودَ وَالْرُكُوعَ لَكَ وَحْدَكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ He says, he does sujood, and then he says, Ilahi. Few lines. Ilahi. Albi mahjubun. My heart has a hijab. My heart is covered by the love of this dunya. You're not the only thing that occupies my heart, and that is a problem. Ilahi. Albi mahjubun. وَنَفْسِي My nafs مَعْيُوبٌ It has flaws, it is ill, it is suffering. Just like we take care of our bodies and when we are ill, we recognize the illness. He says that my nafs is an Ill, has an illness. وَنَفْسِي مَعْيُوبٌ وَأَقْلِي مَغْلُوبٌ And my aql also 
It is not functioning the way that you want it to function. The way that it's going to lead me to ultimate bliss and happiness, dunya and akhirah. And we have been speaking about this for the past 13 nights. That's how our minds and our souls have been manipulated by what we see in social media and on television and what we read and what we have been told to believe. And my desire always overcomes. My desire always overcomes. And my obedience is قليل. My obedience level is low. My obedience is weak. وطاعتي قليل ومعصيتي كثير and my sins are a lot ومعصيتي كثير and then what this is the most important thing ولساني مقر بالذنوب but I come with a tongue that is confessing to you my sins confessing to you all of this confessing to you that I am in trouble Confessing to you that I need you. I've come begging to you. وَلِسَانِي مُقِرٌ بِالذُّنُوبِ فَكَيْفَ حِيلَتِي Now what do I do? And then the first name that he calls is Ya Sattar al -Uyub. You know all of them. But I want you to conceal them. I want you to continue to conceal them. Ya Sattar al -Uyub. And you know all secrets. I cannot hide it from you. And you remove all difficulties and calamities and hardships and depression and anxiety and sadness. Then he says, Forgive all my sins. In the name of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad, then he says, Ya Ghaffar, Ya Ghaffar, Ya Ghaffar, three times. Ya Ghaffar, Ya Ghaffar, Ya Ghaffar, bi rahmatika. I ask you in your mercy and your rahmah. Ya Arham al Rahimin, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Let us raise our hands and read this dua together and conclude for this evening. Allahi. قلبي محجوم إلهي قلبي محجوم ونفسي together ya ghaffar ya ghaffar ya ghaffar ya ghaffar ya ghaffar 
One more time, all of us together. Ya Ghaffar. Birahmatika ya Arhaman Rahameen. Ten times we call on to him in his greatest name. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. اللهم إنا نسألك بمحمد وعلي وفاطمة والحسن والحسين والتسعة المعصومين من ذرية الحسين Oh Allah, every man and woman present in this majlis with a sin forgive our sins cleanse us from our sins اللهم أدخل على أهل القبور السرور اللهم شافي وعافي كل مريض اللهم سد فقرنا بغناك اللهم غير سوء حالنا بحسن حالك اللهم اقض عنا الدين واجرنا من الفقر انك على كل شيء قدير والى ارواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات والعلماء والشهداء وخدمة الحسين and all to, to all your marhumin to all your friends your family your relatives الفاتحه مع الصلوات